So we're at about mile five and a half on the Colorado River, and we're looking at uh, the Coconino Sandstone, which is a lighter colored rock up above, and the Hermit Formation, which is this uh, brownish uh, rock down here below. And we want to look at a couple things here at this uh, contact between the two formations. And we can see this contact all the way down the river. And it's a fairly flat contact. The Coconino sits immediately on top of the Hermit Formation. There's very little evidence for erosion or weathering in between the two layers. And the second thing we want to look at are what I think are sand injectites at the bottom of the Coconino. If we look up here at the base of the Coconino, we see these uh, bits of sand that come down from the Coconino sandstone into the Hermit Formation. They're lighter colored. They kind of look like almost like icicles uh, penetrating down in this formation. Conventional geology believes that the Hermit Formation is a floodplain environment, so a river floodplain, where this was made by rivers and stuff like that. And then the argument goes that the, uh, the climate dried up, and since this was a wet mud, that the wet mud cracked and then uh, made mud cracks and then uh, the Coconino sandstone blew in and filled up these mud cracks. Well, uh, about 20 years ago, I started to uh, look into this to find out if that was a good explanation uh, for these cracks or not. And these are relatively small ones. Uh, we find some really big ones uh, downstream along Bright Angel Trail. And those are about 50 feet in length, at least 50 feet in length and maybe about that wide. And as you get away from the Bright Angel Fault, as you go upstream and downstream, uh, these cracks become shorter and shorter. And so I've been down many trails in the Grand Canyon, uh, measured these things, measured the angle of these things, and so on. And uh, have noticed a couple very interesting things. Number one, the, the deepest cracks or the longest cracks are right next to the Bright Angel Fault, which uh, moved about 200 feet uh, when, it, when it faulted. Um, the other thing that I've noticed is the cracks uh, decrease in length as you go away from the fault. Uh, up the river, down the river, and even across the river to the north, these cracks become shorter. And as I studied the cracks, I did not notice any horizontal layering in them. If these cracks had been uh, filled up by sand falling down into them, if they were open mud cracks and filled up, the layers inside the crack would be horizontal. But even in uh, some of these cracks here, I see some vertical uh, layering in them, and that's very typical of these cracks. And so um, I found some other things uh, as well that indicated these are probably not mud cracks. So I began to develop a new hypothesis that would explain the data uh, that I found. And the, the key piece of data is that the longest cracks are right next to the Bright Angel Fault, and then they, they get shorter as you move away. Um, the other um, key piece of data is that these cracks uh, have, a, have a preferred orientation. In other words, uh, they're all oriented in about the same direction, and I was able to show that um, statistically. And one of the things that happens during earthquakes, if, if, if an earthquake uh, shakes uh, sand uh, that is filled up with water, um, the sand grains will actually come apart. So if my fists represent sand grains, and then imagine my blue shirt uh, being water around all these sand grains. As the earthquake happens, the sand grains temporarily will come apart. And if, if the sand grains temporarily come apart because of the earthquake energy, that sand will flow just like water. And I think that's what's happened here. And also when the earthquake happened, it, it caused the grains in the hermit formation down below here to get packed together and actually open up some space. And so what I think happened is this sand in the Coconino became liquid and then was forced uh, downward into the Hermit Formation. And therefore we think uh, these are uh, sand injectites. Right at the bottom of the Coconino, uh, we see this, this band. It's uh, maybe a little less than a foot thick. It sits right on top of the brownish uh, Hermit Formation. It looks to me from this perspective that there's very little bedding in here. And that's something that I've found at several other sites as well. And uh, what we think this is, it's a layer that's been fluidized. It's actually moved along the base of the Coconino. And then in some places, it's been injected uh, downward into the Hermit Formation. So the reason that these are important is because it eliminates a lot of time from Grand Canyon history. Uh, the Coconino was 
uh, supposedly laid down in a conventional view about 275 million years ago. And then uh, the Bright Angel Fault, which I think made these injectites happen about 50 million years ago, more or less. And so that's 225 million years of time difference. And um, what, what's the problem here is, is that the Coconino had to remain uh, fairly uh, unlithified or it, it wasn't turned into a solid rock for 225 million years. And then when the earthquake happened, there was still water in the Coconino and uh, a process called liquefaction happens, which pulls those sand grains apart and the sand was able to flow uh, down into uh, the cracks. And so this interpretation, I think, is the best interpretation. The, the problem with, that conventional geologists might have with it is it eliminates 225 million years from Grand Canyon history because we still have to have the Coconino uh, soft, uh, not turned into rock, uh, when it gets pushed down into these cracks, uh, making the injectites. The other significant thing that we want to look here at, at, at this boundary is how flat the boundary is. Um, in the conventional way of thinking, there's supposed to be 10 to 12 million years between these two formations, and yet we see very little evidence of weathering um, or erosion at this contact. But the reason the conventional geologist wants to put a lot of time in between here is we go 100 miles south towards Sedona, there's a whole other formation um, in between uh, these two formations called the Schnebly Hill Formation, and it's about 1,000 feet thick and sits right on top of the Hermit, and then you have this thousand feet of Schnebly Hill, and then you have the Coconino. So there has to be some time in the conventional view to deposit that. Uh, we don't have those kind of time problems uh, within uh, flood geology. And uh, so what we think happened is the Hermit was laid down, and uh, after the Hermit was laid down, uh, Schnebly Hill was laid down further to the south at the same time that Coconino began to be laid down over this whole area and eventually on top of Schnebly Hill. So we don't see any evidence of the time here, we don't see any evidence of the erosion, and so we think there's, there's little evidence of those long periods of time that are supposed to be between these two layers. Mm -hmm.